Can you really say that you understand nuclear radiation? For example, this footage is just six years after Hiroshima was destroyed. The city first looked like this image. But in six years, it was completely reborn from the ashes, with bustling streets and rebuilt houses and people just living their lives again directly on the site of one of humanity's greatest tragedies. I used to think that fallout and residual radiation was like a magic radioactive field that just emanated out from where the explosion happened in some sort of like toxic green cloud, poisoning things in a huge area. I thought that the land on which Hiroshima stood would have become too radioactive to be safe for human habitation. Nuclear weapons are definitely scary, but their effects shouldn't be mysterious or magical, they should be understood. I did a lot of research on this, and I think that you can learn most of what you need to know in like 20 minutes to truly understand how humans could repopulate Hiroshima so quickly after nuclear annihilation. Why this blast did not cause long-term radiological damage, but this one did. And I will show you how through stories of people like this man, humans could resist apocalyptic conditions and thrive again. Let's first look at the radiation from the bomb and simplify it a bit. When a nuclear bomb detonates, it releases two major categories of radiation, initial and residual. The initial radiation primarily consists of gamma rays and neutrons released in the very first moments of fission. People exposed to this will become irradiated and suffer from radiation poisoning. This causes organ failure, central nervous system failure, drops in white blood cell count, and tons of other nasty things for the human body. A person who is less than this distance from the Hiroshima atomic bomb's hypocenter would usually have absorbed huge amounts of ionizing radiation, enough to experience severe radiation poisoning as described earlier. However, the main cause of death in this radius would have been thermal burns, or the collapsing and failure of structures resulting from the blast or the ensuing firestorms that swept the city in the wake of the bomb. The firestorm developed within 20 minutes after detonation and destroyed all of the buildings that were left. It had gale force winds blowing in towards the center of the fire, engulfing anything and everything within it. In essence, if you were close enough to receive a highly lethal dose of initial radiation, most people would have died from other causes. It's estimated that about 90% of all deaths in Hiroshima came from the blast, the heat, or the fires. Only about 10% died due to radiation. But despite this fact, radiation sickness was completely new. People and doctors in Japan at the time didn't even know what it was. So it was terrifying. Patients with acute radiation sickness would have shown up to a doctor after the blast with redness of skin, blisters and ulcers, hair loss. These were symptoms that people had never seen before. So it's understandable how terrifying it really would have been. It isn't a perfect analogy, but I think a good way to describe initial radiation is like a very extreme, very powerful sunburn from a small nearby sun. It happens very quickly, is extremely damaging, both externally and internally, but it mostly doesn't leave a long-term radioactive effect on the surrounding environment. The initial radiation basically did not affect the inhabitability on the land on which Hiroshima stood. So there was no fallout-style nuclear wasteland just yet. The second category of radiation is the residual radiation. 
This is the one we're most familiar with, the fallout radiation. I'm going to speak slowly now because this was the most complicated part about nuclear weapons that I really didn't understand and that I needed to in order to figure out why Hiroshima could recover so quickly. A nuclear explosion, like the one at Hiroshima, results from the process of nuclear fission, where heavy atomic nuclei, such as plutonium or uranium, split into smaller, lighter nuclei. This causes a blast from superheated air, heat, and radiation. These lighter nuclei are called fission products. Fission products are unstable and radioactive. Their instability comes from the excess energy within them, a consequence of the fission process. To reach a stable state, these atoms release this excess energy in the form of radiation, undergoing radioactive decay. If these fission products become attached to dirt and debris that is ejected by the blast, then that debris will become radioactive and fall out in another location. Radioactive fallout. That fallout is then dangerous to touch because a person risks receiving a harmful dose of radiation from the attached fission products. Fallout is most of what causes radioactive problems after a nuclear blast. But, the nuclear bomb at Hiroshima exploded in a way that caused very little fallout. The Hiroshima blast was an airburst, meaning it detonated over 500 meters above the surface of the ground. It was not a ground burst, which in addition to causing destruction, would have kicked up a tremendous amount of ground debris, mixing it with the fission products from the blast and then sending it high into the atmosphere, only for it later to fall out of the sky and drop radioactive materials in other places. The Hiroshima blast was an airburst. Hiroshima had low fallout because of this. Okay, now contrast this with a nuclear explosion that had high fallout, like the infamous Castle Bravo test. This was the largest nuclear weapon the United States has ever blown up. But it wasn't meant to be that way. Because of unforeseen reactions with the bomb's nuclear fuel, the explosion was almost three times more powerful than they expected. 15 megatons of TNT instead of six. They did expect some fallout because the bomb was not an airburst, it was a ground burst. But because it was so much bigger than they had expected, it vaporized the coral on the atoll and sent it high into the sky, mixing it with radioactive products and then distributing it across various islands and communities in the form of an ominous gray radioactive snow. The fallout caused 1,311 radiation-induced illnesses, mostly on people that lived on surrounding islands and atolls unexpectedly thrust into the fallout's range. The Lucky Dragon number 5 was fishing outside of the predicted fallout zone. But due to the test's unexpectedly large yield, the boat and its crew of 23 were showered with radioactive fallout, fine white pulverized ash made of sand and coral that the crew at the time thought just looked like snow. They spent several hours in this fallout before heading back to Japan. By the time that they returned, many of the crew members were showing symptoms of acute radiation sickness. They were then hospitalized in Tokyo. Aikichi Kubuyama, the boat's chief radio man, died six months later, making him the first casualty of the Castle Bravo test and of a hydrogen bomb. The incident raised considerable alarm in Japan and globally, intensifying fears about radioactive fallout and contributing to the push for a ban on atmospheric nuclear testing. It's tragically ironic that Japanese individuals were once again victims of another nuclear blast. Castle Bravo made the island of Bikini Atoll uninhabitable for decades. 
About 15 years after the bomb, the US government wrongly concluded that the island site was safe for rehabilitation. So they resettled the former residents onto the island, who they had forcibly removed 20 years prior. However, 10 years later, in 1980, scientists performed additional tests on the island and its inhabitants. They found water wells were too radioactive for use and determined that the local fruit was too dangerous for human consumption. Urine samples from the islanders on Bikini Atoll showed levels of plutonium. The island was radioactive and unsafe because of the fallout. Plants and trees readily absorb potassium as part of their normal biological process. But since cesium, a byproduct of the nuclear blast, is part of the same group on the periodic table, it is absorbed by plants in a very similar chemical process. The islanders, who unknowingly consumed contaminated coconut milk, were found to have abnormally high concentrations of cesium in their bodies. It was decided that the islanders had to be evacuated from the atoll a second time. This fallout is what we think of when we think of the aftermath of nuclear weapons making places uninhabitable. Hiroshima's fallout and residual radiation was meanwhile low. The bomb was relatively small compared to bombs made during the rest of the Cold War, and it was an airburst. Any radioactive fission materials would mostly have been better dispersed into the atmosphere, and the most dangerous ones would not have fallen back to Earth while they were dangerous, because they were not attached to heavy ground debris. In other words, they didn't form fallout. Radioactive fallout is also exponentially worse closer to the time of the blast. Most fission products will decay quite quickly, meaning that they become harmless, the city of Hiroshima's website points out, 24 hours after the bombing, the quantity of residual radiation a person would receive at the hypocenter would be 1 1,000th of the quantity received immediately following the explosion. A week later, it would be 1 1,000,000th. 1 Thus, residual radiation declined rapidly. This follows something called the 7-10 rule. Seven hours after a nuclear explosion, residual radioactivity will be decreased to about 10% of its amount at one hour. And after another 49 hours, it will have decreased to 1%. It's a rule of thumb, nuclear isotopes can behave strangely, but this is mostly accurate. As a side note, this is why it's so important to stay inside after a nuclear explosion, especially for the first 24 and ideally for the first 48 hours. The fallout will be radioactively decaying by the minute, and a house or basement will literally protect people from coming into contact with that radioactive material. Hours can mean life or death. Some dangerous fission products take longer to decay, months or even years. But if they don't form fallout, then they won't be concentrated enough in any single location to be damaging to humans. Now, it's worth noting that little fallout does not mean that there was no fallout. Actually, there might have been more fallout than previously thought. Smoke and dust plumes from the blast rose high into the atmosphere, mixing with the radioactive products of the nuclear explosion. Within an hour or so after the blast, this mixture began to condense and fall back to Earth as rain mixing with more soot and dirt, resulting in a sticky, dark, and highly radioactive downpour that has come to be known as Black Rain. The Black Rain fell in areas to the west and northwest of Hiroshima due to the way that the wind was blowing at the time, with the heaviest fallout occurring within about one to two hours after the explosion. The affected area stretched for dozens of kilometers in some directions, and the rain left a sticky, dark, radioactive residue on surfaces. Recent studies have suggested that the radiation exposure from black rain of Hiroshima survivors might have been a bit underestimated, mainly because previous studies didn't fully account 
for the Black Brain's fallout. Some evidence even suggests that people exposed solely to Black Brain might have higher cancer rates than those who survived the bomb's initial radiation. The severity, the health effects, and even the range of where the rain fell are all still disputed. The Japanese government has been hesitant to recognize those affected by black rain as hibakusha. Keep this word in mind, we'll come back to it later. Only in 2020 did these people finally win a court battle to be recognized for the same medical benefits as those directly affected by the blast. But following on from what the studies cited by the government of Hiroshima said, most of the fission products in the black rain were decaying rapidly, and after a few days, wouldn't have been very harmful. A major typhoon reportedly washed away many of the fission products from the black rain about six weeks after the bombing, although the specifics of this claim are not entirely certain. Even just a few days after the blast, Hiroshima would become at least radioactively safe for humans to re-inhabit. People didn't understand radiation at the time. They moved immediately back into the city after the firestorms died out. And they would have had no knowledge that there could be any danger. About 90% of the city's 76,000 buildings were partially or totally incinerated and reduced to rubble. Hiroshima had 420,000 residents at the time that it was bombed. 80,000 were vaporized instantly, and the death toll would rise to 141,000 in total, as the survivors succumbed to various injuries or the radiation exposure incurred. Tens of thousands of survivors and out-of-town volunteers quickly worked as fast as possible to restore all services to what remained of the city. Electricity was restored to the Ujina area just one day after the bombing, and Hiroshima's main railway station got power back in just two days. By August 20th, just two weeks after the bombing, power was restored to about 30% of the remaining homes in the Delta area. And by the end of November, the entire area got electricity once again. While suffering burns to his body from the blast, Kuro Horino, a 51-year-old water engineer in Hiroshima, rushed to the pump station immediately after surviving the bomb. All the main pumps for the city's water were destroyed. But Kuro turned on the backup pumps and began to repair the main ones. The bomb hit Hiroshima at 8.15 in the morning. And by 2 p.m., the city's water supply was already back online thanks to the heroic efforts of Harina. The Hiroshima Water Authority, to this day, proudly states that the city has had no interruption to water supply for over 100 years. Mr. Harina wrote, When I saw people drinking from a fire hydrant under those terrible conditions after the atomic bombing, I really recognized the preciousness of water and the significance and responsibility of my work. But water still leaked from the open taps of the homes that had been destroyed. Yoshihide Ishida loaded tools into the back of a bicycle cart. Soaked with sweat, he and the other employees crushed leaking water pipes with hammers and stopped them up with cone-shaped wooden plugs. The residents were so grateful, he recalled. But I was worried whether the district would ever be reconstructed. The Bank of Japan reopened only two days after the bombing, offering its limited floor space to the 11 other banks whose buildings had all been destroyed. Tellers worked under open skies, in clear weather, and beneath umbrellas when it rained. And on August 9th, the same day that Nagasaki would be destroyed by another nuclear bomb, some tram services began to resume in Hiroshima. The amount of determination and resilience that people showed is something that I never would have imagined. That a city completely destroyed in under a minute could come roaring back to life so quickly in spite of the sheer scale of the destruction. But given the scale of what was destroyed, there was a lot of chaos and confusion, and a lack of a central plan. 
The mayor and most public servants were killed in the blast. The municipal office employed about 1,000 people at the time, but the day after the bombing, just 80 people reported for duty. Caring for the city's wounded was nearly impossible. 14 of Hiroshima's 16 major hospitals no longer existed, and about 90% of registered doctors and nurses were gone. So-called atomic bomb slums started appearing on the Motomachi district along the Honkawa River, literally just a few hundred meters from the epicenter of where the bomb detonated. Despite these incredible stories of rapid recovery, the city didn't have the means or the money to formally rebuild itself, and it needed a plan for what a post-bomb future would look like. This came when the Japanese government unanimously passed the Hiroshima Peace and Memorial City Construction Law in 1949. The law provided national funding to help with the full-scale reconstruction of the city. With this help, the formal full-scale reconstruction began and the city would turn back into a thriving metropolis. The national government could fund this reconstruction because Japan was experiencing a post-war economic boom. In 1946, industrial production was only 27% of its pre-war level. By 1951, when this footage of Hiroshima was taken, industrial production in Japan had already recovered to pre-war levels. The Japanese government set about strong recovery policies, like involving women in the workforce and focusing on base industrial goods like steel. The nearby Korean War had increased demand for goods, which meant that Japan's industry was soon providing the required munitions and logistics to American forces fighting in Korea. But this massive reconstruction didn't come without problems. There was a divide amongst the residents about whether to memorialize those who died or whether to erase any sign that a tragedy had ever occurred in Hiroshima. Some people thought it should be torn down and that Hiroshima should be a completely new city, said Kenji Shiga, the director of the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum. The Hibakusha in particular didn't want to see reminders of what had happened. That was one example of how difficult it was, and still is, to strike a balance between recognizing the facts of history and building a modern city. The Hibakusha is the Japanese word literally meaning those who survived the bomb. The Japanese government has recognized about 650,000 people as Hibakusha across both Hiroshima and Nagasaki. As of 2022, about 119,000 of them are still alive. It's also estimated that one in seven of Hiroshima's victims was of Korean ancestry, mostly forced laborers during the war, something that is often forgotten when talking about Hibakusha. When rebuilding, the solution that the city chose was to strike a balance. Most of the city would be rebuilt as a modern, prosperous urban center where almost no remnants of the bomb remain. However, at the epicenter of where the bomb was dropped, a peace park would be constructed, dedicated to the memories of the victims, as well as a museum. A few surviving structures would remain standing within the park, along with the so-called A-bomb dome. This building was the closest standing structure to the hypocenter of where the bomb was dropped that was still left standing. Today, now recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, it is the most recognizable reminder of what happened in Hiroshima. At the dome, there's a plaque that reads, as a historical witness that conveys the tragedy of suffering, the first atomic bomb in human history, and as a symbol that vows to faithfully seek the abolition of nuclear weapons and everlasting world peace. Some people have asked the question, why even rebuild on a place steeped in such pain and loss? Humans destroyed Hiroshima, but humans also rebuilt it, said the current mayor of Hiroshima, Kazumi Matsui. This is a holy site, somewhere people can come to compare the horrors of the past with the city Hiroshima has become today. Today, at first glance, you wouldn't even be able to recognize that Hiroshima was once a destroyed city. It's rebuilt completely from the ground up. 
And even in 1951, the young children of survivors could hardly understand what had happened. In 1958, just 13 years after the bomb, Hiroshima surpassed its pre-bomb population. Owing to this roaring recovery and the incredible resilience shown by the survivors and residents in the wake of the tragedy.